Howdy folks! Welcome back to the Steampunk Desperado channel. I'm your host Vaughn Troidy and I am the Steampunk Desperado. This is the channel where we bring in news and reviews of that greatest of all science fiction genres, Steampunk. Now today we're going to do an episode that I had been planning to do for a very long time but I was having a, a, tr a problem with that and the problem was deciding. Because really, for any kind of genre-related channel, you need a top 10 list. What were the top 10 best steampunk novels? I may do one for other types of fiction later on, but this is just novels. Now, I couldn't decide. And I finally got a list of 11, because I decided 10 was a tie. So, without further ado, I'm going to bring you my list of the top 11 <laughs> steampunk novels of all time and please remember that there are a lot of other great ones out there that's why I had such a hard time hard time deciding and so don't feel too discouraged if your novel or your favorite wasn't in here these are mine number 10 the desperado is a southwestern character as you can tell I live in Arizona and I love steampunk that takes place in Arizona and my two ties for, for number 10 take place in the Southwest. The first is Cibola's Promise by Aaron Lawson, 2012. And that involves a group of traveling grifters in 19th century Arizona, including a snake woman called Sybil, very interesting, and a, a group of female automata, automata clockwork that uh, entertain the guests and kind of distract them so that so that the uh, so that the uh, owner of the troop can scam everybody. With one of them has this awesome name, Mischievous. I know it's a horrible pun, but I love it anyway. The other one is Owl Dance by a guy named David Lee Summers uh, from New Mexico. He's an astronomer by trade, uh, but also a great writer. Published in 2014, part of a part of a series, part of a trilogy, and this. And I've met him at some of the conventions. Great guy. He's based in New Mexico, and uh, this book is based in New Mexico. Involves a guy named Sheriff Ramon Morales. Yes, we have Hispanic uh, protagonist in a steampunk novel, which proves you don't have to just be British or a white American Yankee sort to be a steampunk hero. And he's facing these mysteries involving clockwork owls and clockwork wolves and Russian spies and even aliens. Yeah, aliens. And his love interest is a woman named Fatime Karimi and she's Persian and she's like an herbal healer and she's also Baha'i. A very interesting and obscure religion. I have never seen a Baha'i character in a popular novel. So that, that's a first for me. Number nine. Boston Metaphysical Society by, oh, colon, <laughs> subtitle, A Storm of Secrets by Madeline Holly Rosing, 2018. And this is the prequel to Ms. Holly Rosing's very successful and awesome graphic novel series of the same name, Boston Metaphysical Society, which involves an alternate history Boston, USA, and I believe the 1890s or so, and it has some supernatural elements, of course, and has historical characters like Edison and Tesla in it, as we love to do <laughs> in steampunk. And the the character in this prequel is Elizabeth Wellsmar. She's an heiress who happens to be a very powerful medium. She can summon spirits and things like that, which her father is appalled by it, and he's also appalled that she married her bodyguard. Uh, former Pinkerton detective Samuel Hunter, who is also the star uh, of the of the graphic novels, highly recommended. Number eight, you might have heard of this one. Even if you haven't heard of Steampunk, you've heard heard of this one. Mortal Engines by Philip Reeve, 2001. Now this was made into a movie, uh, which released in 2018 by none other than the great Peter Jackson, and he was the executive producer, I believe, and my wife and I were very excited about it. We went to see it. The theater was empty. It's so sad. They promoted it, but somehow the promotion didn't work, and it just didn't receive the accolades it should have. Plus, 
Plus, the reviewers didn't understand it, and they didn't really like it because I guess there wasn't enough of a social justice message or whatever. But it was great. A lot of fun. It involves a, a dystopian future where the cities have become mobile. They have these huge tank treads. The city of London, for example, is a gigantic machine that rolls around, crushing everything in its path, consuming smaller cities for their resources. Uh, there is a land bridge between uh, Britain and Europe now, because of climate change, whatever, and therefore it's able to roam Eurasia and prowl around uh, looking for prey, <laughs> called municipal Darwinism. We did a, we did a thing on this, we did a, a, a review of this on a previous episode, and there's a character called Hester Shaw. She's a horribly disfigured young woman who is seeking revenge against Thaddeus Valentine, who is uh, London's leading scientist, and, and she gets involved with a, a hapless young historian called Tom Nassworthy, who kind of, uh, kind of gets pushed out of the city, and he's trying to get back to London. It's, it's, it's crazy fun. I would, I would think it's great, even if the critics didn't. Number seven, Infernal Devices by a guy named K.W. Jeter. You may have heard me talk about him before. He was the guy who term, invented the term steampunk. This is not his first steampunk novel, uh, perhaps his second, I'm not sure. It was written in 1987, and it takes place in Victorian London, and it's this world of crazy interlocking conspiracies. There's a guy named George Dower. His father was a clockwork master, and he made all these great devices, and he died, leaving George his business and his shop. But poor George, he's just incompetent. He can't hardly fix, he can hardly fix what his father made, much less invent anything new. And a guy named, well, a guy without a name, but he's wearing this black leather mask, brown leather mask, excuse me, comes into the shop and insisting that George fix this box with full of clockwork that, that George's father made. And George doesn't even know what it does. And because of this box, he's pursued George is pursued by all these different weird characters. The Royal Anti-Society, kind of like anti the Royal Society for Science, <laughs> and the Godly Army, um, and that kind of a Cromwell type group, I think, and the Lady Society for Suppression of Ice. Very interesting, intricate, and fun novel. Number six, Bone Shaker by Sherry Priest. She's another American author. She lives in the Northwest, or at least she did at the time that I actually heard her speak at the Tucson Book Festival a few years ago. This novel also takes place in Seattle in the 1870s, and it's an alternate Seattle that's been ravaged by this horrible disaster. A guy named Leviticus Blue invented this drill engine that's supposed to revolutionize mining. And it, in this demonstration, it goes crazy, uh, purses the Earth's crust and releases this gas, this, this toxic gas that turns people into zombies. So because of that, they had to build a wall around Seattle and the city's like a wasteland. And a guy who is actually uh, Leviticus' son, Zeke Wilkes, he's trying to clear his father's name because he thinks that it's not really, not really Leviticus' fault that this, all this disaster happened. And, and he's, the guy's disappeared. We don't know if he's alive or dead. So he goes into Seattle to try and investigate and his mother, Briar Wilkes, goes after him, trying to save him from all these zombies. It's, it's very exciting and, uh, you know, fingernail biting at times. Good, great, great novel. Number five, this is the novel back when, back during the steampunk boom. I had read a couple of books in that, but I, but I asked somebody, what's a good book that somebody's written recently that's steampunk? And they recommended Leviathan by Scott Westerfeld. Again, this is another series. First one was published in 2009, and it's a young adult, and I really, technically, this is diesel punk, because it takes place a little later, and the technology is diesel. It takes place during the Great War, what we now call World War I, and it involves a couple kids, of course, since it's YA, uh, a girl named Darren. She impersonates a boy, so she can join the Royal Air Navy, and a kid named Alexander Ferdinand from Austria. He's a young prince or duke or whatever, and he's being pursued by assassins. Now, the cool technology of this book is that the British have, have uh, biotech, and they've genetically engineered whales to be airships. With the, They're filled with hydrogen, and they're alive. And that's the kind of 
ships that the Royal Navy, Royal Air Navy flies, whereas the Austrians and the Germans have these walkers, like they're like they're like diesel-powered mechs, like in uh, Star Wars, and that's how uh, Ferdinand escapes from his pursuers in this two-legged walking mech. And I'm not a big fan of mechs except this kind, except except like the Imperial Walker type, so it's really cool. Number four. I've done a show on this one, and I have to talk about it again because it was, uh, it was so amazing and in inventive and critically acclaimed. The Difference Engine by William Gibson and Bruce Sterling, published in 1990. Now this is an alternate history steampunk that takes place in the 1850s. Imagine if you will, uh, imagine if you will, I'm going to do my Rod Sterling here, a world where Charles Babbage's difference engine, his mechanical computer, succeeds and starts the information age 100 years earlier. Of course, things change dramatically because of this, and there is this particular computer program, which is the center of the book, which is the plot device. It's a deck of punch cards. If you remember those from the 1960s and 70s and 80s, that's something we actually used. Computer programs encoded on paper cards. And people are pursuing this program because it, it thinks it'll allow them to win at gambling. And in reality, it's even more important than that. And there's some cool historical characters in this book, like, uh, for example, Loris, Lawrence Oliphant, who was a real-life British spy who masqueraded as a travel writer. I can't think of a cooler occupation than that. Imagine traveling the world, writing about it, and being a spy. So you have to check it out. I can't explain it. It's too, there's too much to it to explain it here. Number three, this seldom so shows up on a list of steampunk, and it should. It really should because it is great, and it was wonderful, and it was called The Night Circus by Erin Mergenstern, published in 2011. And as far as I know, she hasn't published any other books. Even though this book was so popular, it spawned kind of a cult, there was a movie option for it that for some reason was never made. I mean, somebody bought the, uh, the rights to it. And it involves this magical circus that appears mysteriously in different towns. And, you know, Britain, America, the continent of Europe, and so on. And it only opens at night and closes at dawn. And they have these wonderful, magical exhibits and experiences in it. And involved in this circus are, are these two young people called Celia, Celia Bowen and Marco Alistair. And they were the protégés of these two powerful magicians. And they, were, they actually have magic. And they, these kids, or these young people have, not kids, young adults, they have magical powers and they're supposed to defeat each other, perhaps even kill one, even kill the other, but of course they fall in love. <laughs> of course you just, you'd expect. So there's a lot of great Victorian type romance in this show, a lot of, uh, you know, bohemian type artsy characters from that era. There's some wonderful clockwork and clockwork uh, artisans. So that's, there's your steampunk, because it's got to have clockwork. Uh, highly recommend it. Uh, uh, Ms. Morgenstern, if you're listening, write another book. Please, 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 please. This, is, this was wonderful. Number two, Warlord of the Air by Michael Moorcock, 1971, before the term steampunk was even invented. This is what I call a looking backward steampunk, which is kind of based on the Edward Bellamy concept of a Victorian writer writing about the glorious future. And this is a character Oswald Bastable, who I guess was actually a character in British children's books uh, during uh, Moorcock's youth. They must have been in the public domain, I would think. And Bastable, Bastable is a British army officer. He goes to the Himalayas to see this sorcerer warlord. And this cataclysm happens, this earthquake. He's catapulted into the future, the glorious future, 1971, where the British Empire still rules the waves and skies with their awesome big zeppelins. The Russian Empire still exists. America still has, you know, the Philippines and its other colonies. Uh, you know, imperialism is still 
rampant and uh, prosperity, peace, no world wars, but there's kind of a dark underside to this world. Bastable decides that he's going to make the best of it. He becomes an airship steward and he travels the luxury airships of the world. Great, cushy job. Until he meets a guy named Ronald Reagan, has an altercation with him. Yes, that Ronald Reagan has an altercation with him and gets fired. <laughs> and because of that, he hires on to a tramp airship steamer and eventually meets a, a revolutionary, the titular warlord, called Shuo Ho Ti, and he's fighting to liberate China from its colonial masters because China is still under the yoke of all these different this different nations that divided it up, like the British and the Russians and the French and so on. And it's pretty it's a pretty interesting and inventive story. Number one, this is going to be controversial because a lot of people wouldn't consider this steampunk. It is definitely more of a cyberpunk, but it's also got steampunk elements, so I'm going to call it number one for doing that amazing hybrid. And this is by none other than the um, very prolific Neil Stevenson. It's called The Diamond Age, or A Young Lady's Illustrated Primer. It's a cyberpunk with a very Victorian feel and a very Victorian style of language, which is very amusing. It, and the, the premise is that in the future, nanotechnology, which is the meaning of the word diamond age, because diamonds are easily and cheaply made by nanotech. A group called the Neo-Victorians, who are people who emulate British, uh, British um, of the 19th century, they become very wealthy making nanotech, and that allows them to live in their own way. They're wealthy enough they can have nice little houses with gardens, real horses, they can have handmade handmade chairs and they can live in this very idyllic uh, idyllic retro way because modern technology has made it possible and there's a lot of interesting philosophical ruminations on the meaning of Victorianism and what its actual strengths were and how it's been unfairly characterized something that probably something that Mr. Stevenson would probably get tr in trouble for writing nowadays unfortunately but in any case, I think it's wonderful. The primer in question is created by a neo-Victorian named John Percival Hackworth. It's a, it's a nanotech storybook. It looks like a real storybook, but it's got these uh, electronic principles that allows it to educate, it's educate a child. It's interactive. And uh, it's made, he made it for the granddaughter of a billionaire to educate her, but it falls in the hands of a young ghetto-dwelling girl named Nell. And poor Nell is abused. She's, it, she's, her mother has horrible boyfriends. She gets beaten. And her, her, her brother's a criminal. And, but this book, this book educates her. She turns her into a refined, proper young lady. She's educated. She's well-spoken. And she's a martial arts badass. And, and this is like the one of the coolest, some of the coolest scenes I have ever read in a book, honestly. <laughs> when, Nell, when Nell kicks butt. I mean, it's really great. So I can't recommend this book highly enough. I know some people thought it was a little bit long in places, but I don't care. It's still great. So that is my list of the top 10, I mean 11, steampunk novels of all time as at this point in time of 2019. You may or may not have other opinions. Please let me know in the, in the comments below. If you have any other selections for that, at some point we'll talk about, we'll talk about graphic novels and or movies and TV shows. Um, although, although it's sometimes a little hard to get enough of them <laughs> to make a top 10 list. And I'd like to very much thank you for joining, for joining me, uh, for spending your time with me on this celebration of steampunk. And please like and subscribe. Again, comment in the comment below and let us know what you thought. For now, this is Vaughn Troy, the Steampunk Desperado, saying adios amigos from the Steampunk Desperado channel, where the past meets the future and the present is extraordinary.